Today's video is brought to you by pine beetles, the reason we have so much firewood available to us. On this tree here, you can see the remnants of the pine beetle. They're called pitch tubes. If I get you in close enough here, find a good one to kind of show you what they look like. A good way to tell when the tree is being attacked is you get these kind of pitch tubes here where when the beetle comes in and attacks the tree, it bores in through the outer bark into the cambium layer and then the sap, the tree oozes sap out trying to displace the beetle and you get these little tubes. So an easy way to see initially before the before the foliage of the tree starts to turn red or discolor is if you see the pitch tubes on the tree, you know that it's been attacked and it's just a matter of time before that tree dies. Before the beetle attacks really got bad, you could maybe get away with, you know, there'd it'd be a strip attack where just one part of the tree, one side of the tree would get attacked. And then the tree could still live for a while because it was just the cambium layer on one, one side would get damaged by the beetles. But uh, once the beetle population really took off, they were just hitting all sides of the trees. And then the way they, uh, they drill their tunnels and then they drill their little, their little lateral tunnels that they put their uh, egg chambers at the end of. And they're doing all this in the cambium layer. And the cambium layer is the layer that's vital to the tree for transporting nutrients. So when they get riddled with all these tunnels, they don't work anymore, and that's what kills off the tree. Yeah, those trees are up there a ways. Not sure. I don't think I can even get the tractor up to this point. Here's a dead spruce. It's, uh, it's a little bit knottier wood because there's so many branches on this kind of thing. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to split, but still burns good. Definitely worth taking and that's a good sized tree. It's got a lot of woodpecker, woodpecker activity and stuff in the bark. I don't know if much of that wood would be worth taking for the sawmill. It's a big tree though. There might be some good some good lumber left in there yet so I'll probably take well we'll see with a tree like that maybe I'll take two 10 or 12 foot sections off the bottom for the mill and then the rest can go to firewood I see from the tops up there there's a few dead trees that way too they'd probably be a little bit easier to get at I don't know I might have to just go invest in a few hundred feet of cable or toe strap or something I see there's a dead tree right there with a fork top that would do good firewood so there's a few down here I'll get the tractor chainsaw and then come back in and take the uh, take the easiest ones to get at that are down low anyway and then I'll have to hike around on that hillside a little bit more see what I can find for a trail to get that other wood out. When I'm doing this kind of thing I start to see though what people were talking about with the uh, with the dual screen the front and back screens on this Osmo Action only one can be on at a time and when you're flipping back and forth between you know trying to vlog with it and then turning it around to show what you're looking at you can't frame the picture very well, so you're constantly having to try to use the double tap, which I'm not having much luck with today. We're pushing and holding the side button to get the to turn on the back camera as opposed to the front camera. So I can see the advantage of having both screens on at the same time, so you can more easily flip back and forth. But uh, for the price difference between the Osmo Action and a GoPro nowadays, the Osmo Action is like half the price of a GoPro. I'll uh, I'll see I'll see what I can do about getting more comfortable with turning the screens from front to back as I need. But I guess time will tell. Maybe I'll have to get one at some point just to try it, see what the difference is between them, see which one I like more. And we have 40 acres, or a little less than 40 acres to work with here, so. 
a lot of it had been logged back in the 80s but there's still as you see we still have area that's got you know good sized trees these spruce aren't you know they're not they're not huge trees by any means but uh, it's a decent, decent size, decent size timber. It gives me something to work with. I'm going to try and leave what I can when it comes to milling lumber. I don't want to take all the biggest stuff, but I'm definitely going to be pulling some of this, some of this spruce out of here. Got several projects on the list already for stuff to make with the mill. You know, the the obligatory mill uh, shack that you have to. You have to make something that you can mill year round up here in the snow and what have you. I'd like to give a solar kiln a try as well. I'd like to get a greenhouse of some sort built over the over the current garden and extend our growing season a little bit. Let us control temperatures a bit better. So the first couple years of the mill, definitely, definitely going to be a busy time. Have lots of opportunity to use whatever wood I can for the various projects that we've been thinking about. And from what I've seen walking around in the drone overflights on the property and stuff, we definitely have the wood to use. Yeah, hopefully the mill gets in before the snow flies. If not, I'll have to set it up in the garage or something just to, not in the main garage, but in the, the, the I'll call it the equipment garage, I guess. It's not quite a pole barn, but it's just a, a building with walls on three sides and a roof, two big open front doors on it. That's probably, I'll set up, I'll set up the, uh, the sawmill in one side. And then that'll give me somewhere to use it in the first winter to just make sure there's no, no mechanical issues with it, learn how to use it, get some hours on it before next spring and then uh, go from there all right i'll uh i'll head up to where i'm stacking the wood for now or where i'm planning on stacking the lumber and if the mill gets in early enough where i was thinking about putting it and then we'll uh we'll talk more when i'm up there it's a little warm out today isn't it pooch yeah cool at night but it still gets warm out during the day so we'll just head over here to where I'm starting to pile up the wood starting to get a bit of a log pile and uh, bringing the firewood trees up and then I can sort out what I want to keep as log sections for the mill and what's going to get turned into firewood I have to resist the urge to keep as much as I can for lumber because I do need firewood. If I don't get firewood, then my electric bill is going to make it where the mill's not saving me any money by turning firewood into lumber instead of heat for the house. That doesn't cost me an electric bill. But uh, this area here that I'll show you is where I've started piling some of the stuff up and then uh, we'll see what I can get gathered over the next month or so. Usually we don't get uh, snow staying on the ground until Halloween, although this year might be a little bit earlier, we'll see. So I still have a couple months to, to get as much in as I can. So far I've gotten two, uh, two trees in for firewood, probably need about 10, 10 or 12 more I guess. And then I'm starting to stack some green lumber that I've been getting out of a few places for the mill. Alright, so here's the area beside the garage. This stack back here, starting to get some green lumber from the area I started clearing out that the sawmill will eventually end up in. It's all pretty small stuff, but I figured while I'm learning how to use the mill, you know, it's at least big enough to, to get something out of, learn how to run the sawmill, get a couple two by fours out of some of it. I'll need stickers anyway, so you know, one by one material I should be able to get out of pretty small trees. And then a few of the butts are a little bit bigger just to allow for maybe the odd two by six and then this is what i've got out for firewood so far just a couple trees cut up into lengths so that the tractor could pull but the uh the butts on them are decent 
you're looking at, my hand is nine inches from thumb to tip. So, you know, we're talking 16 inches across anyway on the bigger ones. Maybe 14, 12, 14. They're checked up, they're a little bit twisted. But I think I'll probably still look to keep at least a 10 foot section out of the bottom of this bigger log here and and this one here just to give me some some dry standing wood to give it a try i don't know how that's going to mill so i'll keep some of it to give it a test see what what it's what it's like to cut and then i'm going to widen out this area eventually and then set up set up this area as the sawmill area until i have enough lumber made that i can go over there and in that opening I showed, uh, showed that in a previous video. I'm gonna open up some land, get rid of some of the smaller trees and flatten the ground out in there. And then that eventually would be the, the permanent home of the mill. I should have room in there for the mill, the solar kiln, log pile, and uh, some lumber stacking once I clear it out more. So this over here is the, uh, I don't know what to call it really. It's not a pole barn per se, but the building I put up when we first moved out here. I just needed somewhere to put the tractor and the tractor implements. So I put up this building. There was already a concrete pad out here, but there was nothing on it at the time. And I wanted to make something to get things out of the weather. So what I'm thinking is if I clear out this side, move the, uh, move some of the implements and stuff out of this area, I can put them over on that side. I can fit all of the tractor and everything over there. I think I can open up this side. It's not a lot of space, but for the smaller trees that I can carry on my own without equipment, I could still put the mill in along this side and then there, that would give me room to come in and put the logs on the mill by hand. Um, it's definitely not ideal. I don't know what I'm going to do about sawdust and stuff. It's going to all pile up on that wall. There's not a ton of space. But to give me somewhere to work for the winter, you know, it's at least something. It gives me a covered area to be out of the out of the snow, get some experience using the sawmill, and uh, get some lumber set up for next spring. So that once the once the snow is gone in the spring, then maybe I, you know, I can move the mill out of here and back into that next area next to the other garage, set it up there for the summer. Do more milling and then uh, see how much lumber I have by the end of the summer and then maybe the next summer uh, would be when I would move the mill into the permanent location with the with the sawmill shack so that's kind of the plan at this point we'll see how it all goes for now collect what I can wood wise hopefully the mill gets in before winter is set in and then go from there <laughs> 